All right. You got a new haircut. Yeah. I'm trying to look less of a millennial. Uh Uh-huh. Like, I want to be, like, generationally ambiguous. Generationally ambiguous. Yes. So I went to, like, a Gen Z, like, a hip salon. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. What I see on the streets of Seoul, at least, Mm -hmm. is basically the late 90s. Okay. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Into the 2000s, I think. Yeah, and, and it's, a, it's a certain interpretation yeah. of that. And right. it looks great. I think everybody looks great now. Well, I think for this particular episode, you probably should have gotten the 1982. Yeah, but that's not available anywhere. Because nobody would want that. Right. <laughs> that's because we watched the 1982 movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High, mm-hmm. which is directed by... Amy Heckerling. Amy Heckerling. Heckerling? Mm-hmm. And she did... She's got two mm-hmm. monumental films mm-hmm. about youth culture. Yeah. The other one is, as Clueless. you said, Clueless. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Clueless, now that I've seen this movie, mm-hmm. I feel like Clueless is the 90s Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The funny thing about seeing Fast Times at Ridgemont High is it's totally Southern California. Right. And it started some trends like uh, Sean Penn's Shoes. Those vans, the vans yeah, yeah. The, the checkered vans. Mm-hmm. After that movie, massive. I think there there's still a bit of a cult following for mm, them, yeah, for okay. those checkered vans. I think. Yeah. yeah, and then I think because of that film, or maybe before, I'm not sure if it was before or after this film did it, but the Roach Clip. Yeah. So you explained mm-hmm. to me what that was because I didn't know what it was. So the Roach Clip is this. Uh-huh. It's the clip, and you clip it in your hair. Uh huh. And then it, it's got like maybe leather or, you know, some kind of braid or something that has feathers on it. Yeah, it looks really that, weird. That women wear in their hair. And it mm-hmm. kind of signaled that you smoke pot or are open to smoking pot. Mm-hmm. Right, that you're this cool. Yeah, because it's it's like, it's girl. designed for Roaches. Smoking, a, smoking a roach. Yeah. Okay, good. And you, yeah, yeah. you know, okay, you clip good it to in know, your hair. Because I never would have guessed that yeah. by looking at it. I was yeah. like, wow, they used to wear weird shit on their hair Mm -hmm. in the 80s, and then that would have been that. Yeah. Yeah. So I was not smoking pot, but I knew what it was, and even people who weren't Mm -hmm. smoking pot were wearing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. It's kind of like people today who wear Nirvana t-shirts, but they have no idea who Nirvana is. Yeah, that that really scares me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, me too. Yeah, that really scares me. (laughs) (laughs) This is now a... 41-year-old movie. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, that makes sense because yeah. I'm 40 now. Yeah, And I was 13 when this came out. Yeah. Yes. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Yeah, 1982. Mm. High school in 1982. And apparently this, this film is, it was, the screenplay was written by Cameron Crowe. Uh-huh. Uh, but he didn't direct this movie. Amy Heckling did. But mm-hmm. he wrote the screenplay and apparently, you know, Cameron Crowe worked for Rolling Stone. Mm-hmm. And he went into a high school undercover. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how old he was. You know, Cameron Crowe is famous for working at Rolling Stone when he was young. Mm -hmm. But he went into the high schools in order to do research, in Mm -hmm. order to write a story. Mm -hmm. About youth culture. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's how it turned into this film. Yeah. So it's got his stamp all over it. It, Yeah. It's got kind of his his thing all over it. You know, that... I feel like that speaks to the accuracy of youth culture, because I Mm. feel like nowadays people who are writing about youth culture are just watching Euphoria and looking at TikTok. And that's not a real representation. Mm. I mean, I don't know, but I can't see that as a real representation of how kids are actually thinking and feeling and living, Mm. because it's still social media and media, traditional media. Right. And so this feels, now that you've said that, I feel like maybe this would have been a more accurate representation of how high school kids were back in 1982. It was very accurate. It yeah? was eerily accurate. Yeah. <laughs> Everything, I mean, the details of this movie are pretty amazing. Like some of the stuff, like I had to tell you some of the things, mm-hmm. like when they get the, the handouts, mm-hmm. you know, when a teacher gives yeah, you a handout, they you smell, sm- the- they all smell the paper. And we used to actually do that. Because it had this mm-hmm. weird, toxic, almost like drug-like <laughs> smell to it. I think I'm old enough to kind of understand what because that the, smell. Because yeah, the printers yeah. had this yes. carbon, I don't know what it was, but it, yeah. it had this, it was yeah, actually like an analog it. print yeah, yeah. kind of thing going on. But yeah, there's so many little details. That it's, it's, this movie is so completely oversexed. But that's kind of how I remember things being when I was 
you know, 15 years old. I mean, that makes Everybody sense. was talking like, about sex. Yeah. Well, you know, I was born in 1983, and a lot of my classmates had parents who had had them as teenagers. Uh, like, yeah. not teenagers, teenage, but, like, really early, you know, mm-hmm. not, like, 16, uh, but mm-hmm. necessarily, but, like, they had met in high school, mm-hmm. and they had had them, like, at 20, mm-hmm, 20 mm-hmm, 19, mm-hmm. even. Right. And so maybe, like, that was just sort of the trajectory of life back then. I feel like maybe it was, like, a lot faster, mm-hmm. fast times at Richmond yeah. High, faster than they are now. Mm-hmm. Like, now I think it just takes so long to experience things and to... Um, do things and to be independent from your parents, mm-hmm. you know, it's just mm-hmm. everything's like prolonged. Right. Um, and the lifespans are a lot, lot longer, but maybe back then that was sort of, you know, you have sex when you're 15. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Like you, that makes sense to me. You really had to kind of figure it out. Yeah. And and so high school is like this factory, mm-hmm. this oh, its own unique subculture where you just have to figure things out. Mm. And there's certain rules but they are social rules and they're interpersonal rules and you really have to fail Mm -hmm. and screw up totally and if you screw up too badly people are going to remember it but there's these codes that you have to live by that's why you do the cool thing Mm -hmm. in order to you know establish your place and then you have to meet your people and then so you create a subculture within the culture Mm -hmm. but i don't know how much of that still exists yeah, I don't know either. I yeah, mean, I went to old. yeah, I went to high school in the '90s, in the mm-hmm. late '90s, and um, that was still the case for sure. Okay. Yeah, um, and I also went to like I went to an international high school. The rules were different, but also the same. Mm-hmm. Like the dynamics, the social structure was pretty much the same, mm-hmm. just international. Yeah. <laughs> but nowadays, I find it very hard to believe that that's the case because technology has made it so different yeah. i'm not it, i'm it's not this isn't even a value judgment mm-hmm. it's just life is so different from before yeah these you know cell phones and like recording devices right. that we have because i saw a clip there's this clip on youtube that's going around And it's actually going around Korean Instagram, Mm. like the the Korean Instagram community. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a typical American high school in 1993. Okay. And all the Koreans were freaking out. They were like, these people were so cool. Maybe it's cool because there's a, I mean, there's a lawlessness. Definitely. Yeah. Back then. And again, that's part of figuring shit out. Mm -hmm. But this is definitely in this movie like Mm -hmm. nobody's sharing anything nobody's taking any pictures there's a moment when when jennifer jason lee's character Mm -hmm. stacy stacy yeah she says here take my picture Mm -hmm. because over the summer break i want you to remember what i look like yeah which is pretty profound but i remember that like you you would want to take a picture of someone you care about and carry a picture with you in your wallet in your wallet yeah Yeah. and it's this great picture of Mm -hmm. her and then she's also talking to um, Damone, mm-hmm. but she's talking about, don't you want to have your picture taken? He's like, nah, mm-hmm. I know what I look like, which is yeah. kind of a funny line. Because he's totally from like the 1930s or something. Yeah. <laughs> like he's, was that a thing back then? Like, I mean, he's kind of an outcast. He doesn't really, f- he's not with the, like everybody in school knows him. And there was always this guy in high school. That's the other thing. There was always mm-hmm. this guy in high school, like, like. Mike Damone, or mm-hmm. whatever his name is, who was selling you bootleg tapes of concerts, cassette tapes for mm-hmm. like a dollar, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and but or you know, you know maybe he was dealing drugs or but maybe right. not. He was, you know, just like he was into something that mm-hmm. was kind of outside. Everybody knew him. Mm-hmm. He dressed in his own way. There's these strange kind of wanderers mm. in '80s high school culture who would migrate to the different tribes mm, and be able to um, integrate with them. Makes so sense. I think Damone is one of those guys. That makes sense. But yeah, so he's the kind of guy who would say, I know what I look like. Mm-hmm. And she's like, yeah. yeah, but don't you want to see, you know, your yeah. picture? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so funny today because we're inundated with images of ourselves totally. and everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Can we talk about Sean Penn? Absolutely. We can talk <laughs> about Sean Penn. My God. 
So apparently, uh, Amy Heckerling, she did the casting for the movie. Mm -hmm. So brilliant to mm -hmm. her on the casting because the casting is really incredible in this movie. Uh, I, I saw a thing where she came in and saw Sean Penn sitting on the floor, mm -hmm. you know, for the auditions. And he was sitting on the floor and he looked up at her. And just in that look, she thought, oh, my God, mm -hmm. this guy's intense. Yeah. This guy has to be Jeff Spicoli. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Prior to that, I guess who they were thinking of was Matthew Broderick. Yeah, that's very difficult to imagine. <laughs> it yeah. is. But yeah, he he was so amazing in this movie. He really was. I mean, he was just, he was that character. He was Like, that it character. wasn't even Sean Penn. Yeah. Like, it was Jeff Spicoli or what, is yeah. that his name? Yeah, Jeff Spicoli. Yeah. And, um, and it's amazing that he was able to uh, sort of take off that clothing mm -hmm. throughout his career and like yes. be other people, be other characters. I think characters. he actively tried to yeah. do that. <laughs> because he, it was just so perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, the very first movie that I had ever seen in my life mm -hmm. was apparently Gremlins, the second one. Oh, yeah. This and Phoebe Cates had made such an impression on me. And I forever, and I still think that she's the prettiest girl I'd ever seen. Like, so I have did no us idea. guys. Yeah. <laughs> I think those childhood imprints are really important. And I think, like, everybody I think is pretty now, even, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is somewhat based on, like, Phoebe Cates or um, Brooke Shields mm -hmm, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Her boobs were great. I could see why. <laughs> There's a lot scene, of boobs in this. There's yeah. a lot of. Jennifer maybe Jason underage Lee. Yeah. boobs going on. I don't think they were underage, no, but I think underage. Jennifer Jason Lee's boobs were really great. Like they, these mm -hmm. were like some natural 80s boobs mm -hmm. that we were looking mm -hmm. at. And they were, I could see why these um, scenes are kind of iconic. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and also women back then were, I think, hyper-sexualized. I mean, when were they not? That's but the that thing was, with this movie. It's, yeah, it's yeah. a hyper-sexualized mm -hmm. movie. But it's so... It's interesting that it, you know it's it's directed by a woman because in a way you could you would think it was directed by a man with all of the so no, nudity, but no. it's really not exploitative. It's, it's very not, much about right. girls in yeah. high school. It's a very realistic yeah. depiction of girls in high school exploring their sexuality, and it's not that serious. I like the fact that they dealt with certain things without being overly dramatic about it because that's how things happen in high school for mm -hmm. girls. Exactly. Even the A word that rhymes with shush, shush motion, <laughs> the A word that rhymes with shush motion. <laughs> I can't even figure that out. Abortion. <laughs> oh. So that, what you, I just said. I think you said, can say yeah, the word. Even like the abortion aspect mm -hmm. of it. I, I did appreciate that there wasn't a political statement Right. On, you know, that. Because yeah. usually when girls go through this in high school, yeah, it's not political. It's mm -hmm. real life. And, you know, they're going through this. And privately. They, yeah, privately. And then you kind of have to find a way to move on. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, it shouldn't be political. Yeah. And so I liked the fact that they, and I'm sure there was some sort of political aspect to putting that in the movie. I don't know, but it was just sort of like... But it did seem very apolitical. Yeah, it, it was just very seemed just like, like a thing that ha would happen to some girls. And it does. And it, it does, happens, yeah. It happens a lot. When I was in high school, a lot of people mm -hmm. went through that. And uh, that was very realistic. I also thought that the dynamic between Linda and Stacy. Yeah was very realistic. Mm -hmm. Linda being the hot girl who acts like she's so much more mature. Right. But she kind of isn't. Right. We don't know if this boyfriend, this older boyfriend even really existed because he never really materializes, mm -hmm. right? She might have been lying. That happens a lot, you yeah, know? Yeah. And um, lots of really pretty girls are scared of men. Yeah. And they yeah. kind of like don't date throughout high school. This happens a lot. Like right. I've, I've been the best friend of a lot of Linda's. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was really realistic. Um, well, there's the, just to pause on that for a minute, mm -hmm. there's the catch 22 with girls, mm -hmm. which is different from guys, mm -hmm. which is you're, if you do it, you're a slut. If you don't do it, you're a prude. Right. And right. so there's no win situation mm -hmm. in that within the culture of being a girl and being mm -hmm. a popular girl. Mm -hmm. One advantage in your status, I think, is to tell stories. Mm -hmm, for sure, yeah. 
of being older because everybody wants to be older right, in right. high school. And so she's presenting this wise older person. And you're right. We never know if this older boyfriend actually exists. I'm saying this because mm -hmm. I had a friend who pretended that she had an older boyfriend. I'm not surprised yeah. at all. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I think one of my guy friends who turned out to be gay later pretended that he had an older girlfriend. Oh, uh, well, I could see why. Yeah, yeah. But that it just happens a lot. Like, yeah. you know, you just bank up this mysterious, like, older, you know, person. Yeah. Because it's also, like, very cool to be desirable to mm -hmm. older people mm -hmm. at the time. Because, like, when you're young, you don't really feel like you um, could attract older people. Mm -hmm. Where it's actually not true, but like when you're young, you don't really know the power that you have. Right. Yeah. Yep. Totally. <laughs> I have a question for you. I mm -hmm. wanted to ask you: Do you think that uh, was Phoebe Kate's character a good friend to Stacy? Yes, I think. Linda so. was Linda a good friend yeah, to Stacy? Yeah, I Stacey? think so. Yeah. I think so too. Yeah. Um, there's a whole other movie about Linda. She was probably doing going through her own. Mm -hmm. figuring out like you know growing up yeah. and you know figuring shit out um and she has her own kind of you know set of battles that she's going through mm -hmm. um i'm actually pretty usually movies don't do this like they make the really pretty girl the heroine and then the best friend is like yeah but this was very realistic this yeah, this yeah. happened quite a lot in movies during this time was that mm -hmm. the, the the kind of sort of introverted one mm -hmm. is the is the protagonist mm, okay so whereas yeah you're right it's different now mm -hmm, yeah. um but i think this was very common during this period of time in order to appeal to the introverts mm -hmm. who like to go to the movies i think mm, yeah 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 I, I have another question for uh -huh. you and i have my own answer to mm -hmm. it. actually i don't know if i have an answer mm -hmm. to this we talked about mike damone mm -hmm. and there's mark mm -hmm. who is has a crush on stacy mm -hmm. And they have a date, and it's very awkward, and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Is Mike Damone a good friend to Mark? Not necessarily, but I wouldn't like cut him off. What is your answer to this? My answer is in in the first two thirds of the film, mm -hmm. he's a great friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like he gives him, but he's kind of like Linda. Mm -hmm. He's talking from a superior place, but we learn later that he's really not very good at sex. Right. <laughs> um, but he's kind of, he's helping him, you know, he's encouraging mm -hmm. him. Yeah. And, and every, you know, I was the shy, introverted person in high school, mm -hmm. too. You kind of need this friend who's going to encourage you and make you feel good about yourself mm -hmm. in order to approach a girl, for example. And he really does that. And he has no reason to hang out with Mark, right? Mm -hmm. But he does. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he really values him as a friend. But then he sleeps with the girl that he has a crush on. Mm -hmm. right. And it's because, now here's the interesting thing, mm -hmm. Stacy is has decided she likes him instead. Right, because and she, she thought kinda, that Mark... She really is aggressive. Yeah, yeah. But she, she didn't that. think that Mark liked her because he ran out when they were making out. Okay, that yeah, yeah, yeah good. Yeah. Okay, so that mm -hmm. kind of absolves her a little bit of, of going after... Mm -hmm. His friend, which is a really shitty thing to do. Okay, Again, so these things happen these, in high school. I was Stacy. <laughs> okay, go, okay. Please elaborate. In a lot of ways, I was As I, I learn Stacey. more about my wife. Okay, so I was Stacy because I was a little shit starter, first of all. Mm -hmm, a I could lot see that. of drama mm -hmm. was caused by me. But I was also always the best friend of the prettiest girl. I could see that. Yeah. And I was the less attractive friend, but also I got more guys than my friend. Because I think men, I think especially guys in high school, they don't go for the prettiest girl because they're not confident that yeah. also she's acting totally. all superior because, mm -hmm. you know, she has an older boyfriend or whatever. Yeah. And I happen to be there mm -hmm. and I'm not bad. And so like I end up dating like all the dudes yeah. and then it becomes really fun. Shit starting is really fun when you're growing up. And yeah, it you is. Kind of like, it's also an experimentation of like your power as a female. Mm -hmm. I frequently would go after, like, the best friend after I dated, like, somebody. And this was all very innocent. I didn't sleep with anybody. But, yeah. like, I would frequently go for, like, the best friend because mm -hmm. I just wanted to see if I can do it. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, I'm not proud of it. Yeah, but, yeah, um, no, that's honest. Yeah. 
I mean, I was like what fifteen. Yeah. I, it was just, but it's it's a thing that like you're trying. This is this is the thing. It's you're trying out your relationships with people. Totally, yeah. yeah. But I also this experimentation process experimentation process allowed me to never do that as an adult. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I did these things, I saw what would happen. Mm-hmm. And then as an adult, I'm a very like mm-hmm. clear, like I'm, I'm a very clean mm-hmm. kind of person when it kind of very monogamous mm-hmm. person as an adult. Yeah. Something clicks in your yeah. mid twenties, yeah. I think, and, you, and yeah. you change priorities. Yeah. And so I was a little shit starter just like Stacy. And yeah. so I totally understand why she did that. She probably felt a little bit slighted by Mark yes. going just randomly making an excuse to go out in the middle of a makeout session when yeah. he could have like had sex with her. Yeah. Right. But I also understand as an adult woman, I understand why Mark did that. Yeah. You know, I was kind of like Mark. Yeah. I was incredibly shy and awkward and <laughs> yeah. no confidence. And then something around my early twenties, I flipped a switch. Yeah. So when I was 15, like, let's say somebody just like walked out on me using mm-hmm. his sister's car as an excuse yeah. during a makeout session, I would have been like, well, F you. I'm going to go after your friend. See, this is the dynamics yeah. when you're 15, 16 mm-hmm. years old that, that you don't understand that there's other mm-hmm. things involved with this, mm-hmm. which is, you know, you're kind of, you're internalizing of the, of, of what's going on and the, and the moral teachings you've been, you know, just say no. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. you know, if you have sex, you're going to have babies and things like that. Yeah. I was a big time, super ego, moral <laughs> internalizer when I was 15 years yeah. old. If me being Mark in that situation, I would have not accepted his apology. That's right. Well, me. that's valid too. No, I, I understand. Yeah. yeah. But as somebody who, like, once again, as an adult woman who can see their all of their perspectives, mm-hmm. and I could see why everybody did what they did, I would say that in the long scheme of things, yeah. in the grand scheme of things, whatever you did before the age of 25, yeah, yeah. I don't think represents who you are. <laughs> Yeah, and and I think for a for a movie, it makes better cinematic sense mm-hmm. to accept the apology mm-hmm. because everybody not only to close the film, but it shows that everybody is just trying again trying to figure shit out. Totally, yeah. We needed Mark mm-hmm. to accept his apology, I yeah. think, and then he's able to go back to Stacy. Again, I wouldn't have done that. Mm-hmm. I would have written her off. Right. Right. But it makes it, it makes better sense. It makes him a more charming character. Mm-hmm. And it just shows that in high school, none of this shit is so important. It really isn't. Yeah. I also feel like um, Mark is a great guy. And he's going to grow up into he's gonna a, grow a up solid, to be a great guy. Great yeah. guy. Mm-hmm. And I can't say the same about Mike. <laughs> I thought you were going to say I can't say the same about Stacy. I'm not sure about Stacy. I'm not sure about Stacy either. Yeah, yeah Stacy has a long way. To she's go. gonna she's gonna go to Europe for a year. Yeah, and um, you know, meet up with some uh, Bohemians. I don't even and know. I have yeah. no idea. Yeah, I mean, she might end up in Berlin or the East Village. She might also be married at 22. But yeah, there's so many things. There's so yeah. many ways that she could go. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about some of the cameos. Yeah, there were so many cameos in this, and I was like, I was identifying. You identified them. everybody. You're really good at identifying faces. I, have, I seem to have a thing with faces. Don't yeah, I? not names, but faces. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I instantly saw um, Nicolas Cage, mm-hmm. who at this point was Nicolas Coppola before mm-hmm. he did his name right. change. So this is apparently his first movie. Really? I think so. Um, I mean, that makes sense because he probably like dropped the name Coppola after he yeah, started getting he actual did. roles. Yeah. So this pr- might have been his first movie. Yeah. yeah. There's Forrest Whitaker, who is, yes. of course, instantly identifiable. Mm-hmm. We could talk about the weird thing about the black athlete trope. There was in high school, the star black athlete. Mm, I could see that. Yeah. And so that was Forrest Whitaker's character. Yeah. They kind of made him out to be this angry um Intense, unapproachable, scary mm-hmm. yeah. kind of black man, mm-hmm. which is not a good mm-hmm. look right now. Um, but there's him. And then there was, I also, I thought it was Nancy Wilson in the car when mm-hmm. Brad is driving and he mm-hmm. flirts with this girl and he realizes yeah. he has his pirate hat on. And I was like, there's no, that's too big. It's like too far of a reach. But Yeah, but it was her. Mar- she was married to Cameron Crowe, but I think this was before... Then I'm not sure. Maybe they were dating. Maybe they were dating, mm-hmm. yeah. 
Um, who else? Oh, uh, Anthony Edwards, mm -hmm. who was Goose in mm -hmm. Top Gun, mm -hmm. and he was the doctor on ER. Mm -hmm. And there was Eric Stoltz. Yes. And Instantly recognizable. Yes, Eric Stoltz. <laughs> and he was just Eric Stoltz. Yeah. Like, but everybody knows who he, mm -hmm. who he is. So there's Anthony Edwards, Eric Stoltz, and Jeff Spicoli, mm -hmm. uh, Sean Penn, who were the surfer dudes. Yeah. And they would get stoned in their van. Mm -hmm. They would be hotboxing in the van. Yeah. Yeah, those are... Some of the cameos. Yeah. I, the Nicolas Cage one really surprised me yeah. because he was barely even in the shot. Like a like couple, you, like you two just spotted him. Yeah, you just yeah. spotted him like, oh Working. my God, is that Nicolas Cage? Yeah. <laughs> we should talk about Mr. Hand a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I had the teacher, Mr. Nagatani, yeah. who taught history. Uh -huh. So Mr. Nagatani taught history. And that I is used the most San Francisco thing that yeah, I've ever heard. Yeah. Japanese guy. <laughs> yeah. I would always sit in the back mm -hmm. and I would be joking around with my friends. Mm -hmm. And when we got a little too rowdy, he would stop his lecture and he would say, you guys are the kind of guys who are going to end up on the front line of the next war. Oh my God, so intense. Yeah. And he would say this repeatedly. And, <laughs> and we'd be like stifling laughs yeah. as he's doing this yeah. but we would pretend like we're scared of what yeah. he's saying <laughs> um so there were a few teachers like oh mr hand but yeah. mr hand was particularly um I, I never had a teacher that aggressive like announcing really? students grades mm. uh, shaming them you know nothing that mm -hmm. overt but it worked for the film, and mm -hmm. he was a good character. And he's a really good teacher. He's a really good teacher. He went to Jeff Spicoli's house to, mm -hmm. you know, teach him some history mm -hmm. and waste his time because he wasted his time. Yeah. You know, you don't realize when you're in high school that the teachers don't want to be there either, that they're doing a job that they don't necessarily kind of want to. Yeah, and they're really yeah. fed up. Like, you think that they're there because they want you to, that they want to be there or yeah. something. I don't know, in high school, like, you, this bratty, like, oh, like, oh, teachers, like, mm -hmm. so inconvenient. Mm -hmm. He, you know, the teacher is, like, trying to get me to do this, and, like, that's mm -hmm. his raison d'être, you know? Mm -hmm. And But it's, and then you grow up and you realize, like, they don't want to be there. Like, they yeah. want to, like, go home and drink wine. <laughs> yeah. It's funny that I turned out to be a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have some teacher friends who really genuinely want to go home and drink wine mm -hmm. like they don't want to be there yeah i i think of some of the teachers that i tortured mm -hmm. i had a really freaky teacher who taught math mm -hmm. and he used to give tests on a scantron mm -hmm. you know fill in the bubble there was a scene actually where jeff spicoli is filling out his scantron and he does it in the shape of a surfboard we've done that too we did, did that, that too yeah i did that because i totally didn't study yeah. for this test yeah. Anyway, I was doing, I was taking my math test mm -hmm. two thirds of the way through the test and I'm doing fine, mm -hmm. you know, I think, even though I'm terrible at math, I was always terrible at math. And he comes up and he had punched out the holes in the Scantron, mm -hmm. you know, for different oh, yeah, answers yeah, like yeah, A, B, yeah. C, D, but he just had them in his hand in his, as a handful. And he comes up to me and he puts them on the desk in front of me <laughs> and he goes, here's all the answers. And then he walked away and everybody's looking at me uh -huh. and I was like, what? Was That's that. insane. So that he is... must have thought that I was cheating, even though I wasn't cheating. Right. So there's a couple things going on. Mm -hmm. That was weirdly passive aggressive. Also insane. And kind yeah. of insane. And also I wasn't cheating. Right. So, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, teachers yeah. are human beings. but and, and they also sort of like, we were doing shady shit back in high school, but like the teachers thought we were doing something worse. Like, uh, okay, yeah, so for yeah, example, yeah. I would go to this boys room like we 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 were in a dorm dorm facility kind mm -hmm. of we were in a boarding school mm -hmm. and i would go to this boys room and it's because he was a guitar player and we were like writing songs together i shit you not that mm -hmm. was what we were doing how cute they thought we were having sex in there yeah, they yeah, were yeah. so convinced mm -hmm. that we were having sex in there that it just became like the accusation became the truth and yes. now that i think of it that was such a violation mm -hmm against towards us mm -hmm. both of us i want to sometimes i want to go back to that teacher and sue him like mm -hmm. you know it's just, that's yeah. like grounds for a lawsuit yeah, now. Yeah. but um yeah and then we would be smoking cigarettes but they thought we were doing drugs you mm -hmm. know like that kind of thing 
Yeah, yeah. So we weren't not doing something that mm-hmm. we we were doing something that we weren't supposed to do. But they would they're imagine because as an adult, you're imagining some crazy shit. Absolutely, because you're an adult. Yeah, and I think that's something that teachers need to be be aware of. It's so weird because they have to be diluted versions of parents, mm-hmm. law enforcement. And judge and jury, mm-hmm. and they're so not qualified and for not any of that. They're not qualified for yeah. any of that. They have a specialty that they that they know, or a series of specialties, uh, and they teach them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> we we just put a lot yeah. on teachers with too, way too way much. too much. Yeah. yeah, and the education system doesn't really make sense anymore. I mm-hmm. feel like you know there's no need for all that yeah. restriction. Right. You know? 